The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. very much. If you want, you can clap and I'm done, but no clapping at the beginning. I haven't earned it yet. Um, so this is sort of part two of, of kind of the two track little mini education, uh, two talk mini little education track here. And Greg, uh, who spoke just before, how many of you are here for Greg's talk? Pretty good number of you. So Greg, uh, uh, longtime friend and colleague, spent many, many years at Red Hat. Uh, uh, a lot of them part of Red Hat's kind of community group um, before he went off to uh, uh, ISKME, the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. It's been interesting, right, to give you guys a bit of a, 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 bit, of, a bit of scope here. It's been interesting because his focus, education's a big place, right? People are getting educated from the moment they're born until the moment they die. Um, Greg has been focusing a lot on K-12 education. Um, Red Hat, has done a few different things over the years when it relates to open source and education. I want to start by talking about what some of those things are, but even before I talk about that, I want to talk about why, right? Uh, and not so much why Red Hat cares, but I want to first tell you why I care. Um, and some of those reasons are the same. Uh, the thing that inspires me the most about open source and that makes me want to work in the industry in the, in the subset of the tech industry where I can participate in open source and Linux and things like that, uh, is the fact that I, I firmly believe that all of us are part of uh, a movement that has inevitability behind it, that is already on the right side of history, and that is going to prove time and time again that a certain set of ideas, right, that we call the open source way of doing things, um, will always be better and will always be more successful uh, than maybe whatever the incumbent way of doing things in a particular area is. And software is where we've had tremendous success with that, right, over the course of the last, you know, 25 years or so. Um, so now the question is about how we leverage what we've learned about an open source way of doing things to make better software and how we bring that to other, uh, to other parts of the world. And, and, and that's part of what I love about being in this industry is that I feel like you know, we're lucky enough to think about that problem and to try to explore that problem, right? And one of the things that, uh, that, that Red Hat cares about, uh, I've been at Red Hat about seven years, um, is making sure that this open source, this thing that we call the open source way, has the ability to grow just beyond that software, right? So my job at Red Hat, what is my job at Red Hat? What does my team do? Um, Part of what we do is attempt to codify this thing that we call the open source way, the theory of how you do things in a community, how you bring transparency, how you allow the best ideas to win, how you create you know, a public roadmap that can be actionable by anybody, right? And how you use that to build uh, an end result that has value to all sorts of different constituencies, right? And those of you who have, who have wandered through the Red Hat ecosystem over the years have almost certainly learned about the Fedora project. And that is the example 
from a software side of the open source way, in theory, delivered into practice, right? And that's what we do in software. It's been very successful, um, and that's great. So the question that, 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 that my team is fortunate enough to be able to think about is, what's the analog to that in other areas, right? And one of the places that we have spent a lot of time is education, right? And Red Hat's forays into education have taken a few different, uh, a few different uh, angles, but all of them come from this underlying principle and this underlying desire to make sure that a company like Red Hat, which has a megaphone, right, and an opportunity to speak about the open source way with credibility, speaks about it in more places than just software. One of the places that we do that, there's two places that we do that that I want to bring your attention to. One of them is this website called theopensourceway.org, right? This is a wiki. Uh, any of you could come here and, and read it, print out, uh, uh, you know, a nice little PDF of it, contribute to it, and it talks about different things that we've learned about organizing and building communities with different examples from software, from Fedora, from, you know, from all sorts of things. We link to you know, important books like Carl Fogel's book that give more information. This is kind of a pamphlet. It's like a wiki pamphlet that talks about the open source way in theory, right? In practice, Red Hat's got this thing called opensource.com. And I was saying a minute ago, the point that I was trying to make is that one of the things we believe in from a branding point of view is that we have a responsibility to share uh, and spread the theory of the open source way into as many places as we can, right? So opensource.com is sort of a branding exercise. And sure, it's a branding exercise in part for Red Hat, but it's also a branding exercise for this generic idea that we call the open source way to try to show people how that can apply to business, to government, to health, to law, and near and dear to the hearts of several of us, uh, to education, right? And we've got you know, all these different articles uh, that talk about um, different places where we see open source principles either being successful or failing, right, in the education space. So that is some of what we are doing at that high level. Now let's think about some of the actual projects that, that, that Red Hat maybe has thrown itself into over time and it's gonna get us to what the current project is, right? Um, Greg actually uh, you know, was talking earlier about uh, a lot of the work that he did uh, with the One Laptop Per Child community, right? And, and he was one of the people who sort of pioneered Red Hat's uh, forays into education uh, starting with that project, right? And Red Hat uh, spent a lot of time and a lot of engineering effort trying to help make One Laptop Per Child successful. Um, I would argue to you that one of the great things that came out of One Laptop Per Child was the entire netbook industry. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, probably billions of dollars of, uh, of hardware innovation. Um, and by the way, you know, a lot of kids also got their hands on uh, the actual OLPC XO and were able to begin to learn, uh, you know, uh, faster and differently than they would have ever had the opportunity to do so. And that was all great, but uh, we had to make tough choices, right? Uh, the team at Red Hat that has the luxury of thinking about these sorts of things like education is a small team to begin with and you know, one and a half people on that team actually have the ability to, to, to focus on education. So the choice that we have made over time at Red Hat is to try to focus on higher education, right? And why is that? Well, 100,000, you know, we looked at some stats from the, from the ACM and the IEEE, and the best that we can figure, there's something like 100,000 computer science degrees, software engineering degrees, given out in the United States every year. How many of you are in a position where you are either hiring or working with new graduates who are just out of college with any sort of computer science skills? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. You can speak loudly, and then I'll repeat it to the microphone. How much knowledge and experience are the people that you are coming in contact with who fit that description, how much knowledge and experience do they bring of open source methodologies, of having worked in any real open source projects or with large code bases and with large groups of people on anything real? How are people doing? 
We got zero in the back. We got a horrible right here. Thumbs down over there. Has anyone had a, a successful uh, case? Even one? Okay. Yes? Okay. So we have a couple sort of success cases. We had very people very quick to say that people coming out of school didn't have that sort of experience. Um, Red Hat entrusts me from time to time with hiring responsibilities, with being part of interview teams, engineering department, other departments. Uh, it's something that we worry about a lot, right? Um, uh, speaking for myself, I would love to see Red Hat be able to hire so many more new graduates than it actually does. Um, but part of the problem is that the sort of engineer that we can drop into, you know, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora code bases and not have them, you know, lose the respect of their peers and just drown underneath the massive amount of stuff that they have to do. Those sorts of engineers only exist after they've had several years of experience working in these communities, right? Um, and people aren't coming out of college ready to dive right in. We've seen some success cases in Fedora, and this is part of the value that Fedora provides to Red Hat, right? Is not only a pipeline uh, of innovation, right? It's not only the open research and development lab that allows innovation to exist that can go into Red Hat Enterprise Linux or could go into anything else from anybody who wants to take advantage of Fedora, but Fedora also represents a recruiting pipeline, and not only for Red Hat, but for any company that needs people who have open source experience. Um, I've got three interns working on my team. All of them were doing stuff for Fedora when they were still in high school because they were too smart for their class. They were bored by what they were learning, right? Greg mentioned earlier that the biggest problem that we see in schools is that kids are bored, right? They were bored by what they were learning. They already knew everything that was trying to be taught to them on computer day every other Thursday. Um, and the only place where they were able to find any sort of intellectual excitement was in open source land, right? Um, and we had 15, 16 year old kids who made contributions to you know, the translation effort that goes on the front page of fedoraproject.org that millions of people were seeing and using. And that is an opportunity at age 16 or 17, a guy named Ricky did that. It's an opportunity that normally is only reserved for someone who has already graduated from school, gotten a job, you know, and been told by their boss, well, the project we want you to work on is, you know, figuring out how our web page can be translated into different languages, right? And the thing we've learned, right, that, that, that sort of bucks the trend of the classic education system, which says, first you have to learn a bunch of stuff, and then maybe we'll tell you that you're certified in those things you've learned, and then you can go out and try to do some stuff, right? Open source turns that on its head, and it says, you can try to do anything you want, and you can learn everything you need to know kind of while you do it. Um, so the choices that Red Hat is trying to make around how it, where it picks how to influence this gigantic world that is education, right, is attempting to do so in, in, the, in the university level. Because what I want to see is a day where every university student who gets a computer science degree walks into their first job, wherever that happens to be, and if they don't see open source principles, if they don't see this thing that we call the open source way, that theory, if they don't see that being done in practice already in the place where they're working, I want that to be you know, as anathema to them as if they were asked to, you know, uh, uh, do all their work only using DOS or, or, or code, you know, or, or use punch cards to create their program, right? I want proprietary software and everything that goes along with that to just, uh, you know, to be seen as, wow, you are, uh, this is a completely backward place, right? So that next generation will swoop in, having learned about open source, having experienced open source from early on in their education, and bring that change 
right? Which eventually raised, that tide raises all the ships of everyone who cares about open source. Whether you're a company like Red Hat, whether you're an individual trying to, you know, build your own career and make sure that the skills that you have in open source are properly valued in the industry, right? I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit, but, um, uh, but that's kind of, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's an attempt to at least position uh, why we at Red Hat are trying to focus uh, on, on higher education. Um, so we talked about the theory of the open source way. We talked about in software that theory being translated uh, through, among other things, the Fedora project, to give the Red Hat example, into a community of collaboration and of productivity, right? So on the education side, we try to move from strength to strength, right? We've identified this thing called the open source way. We know how to build communities. We built a Fedora community. That created some good results. So how do we mimic that on the education side? So we've created this thing called teaching open source. And, and, and I should be careful when I say we, even, because the guy who registered this domain name is a professor at Seneca College in Toronto, Canada, named Chris Tyler. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what Chris is doing and what his school is doing, because it's very, very interesting, right? Um, one of the problems, let's talk about problems for a minute. One of the problems that I see in the Fedora project, and I, and I, and I think it exists in many large open source projects, is that we spend a lot of time talking about how important it is to bring new contributors in and to bring them in in a way that sets them up for success, right? We spend lots of time talking about mentoring. We spend lots of time wringing our hands and saying that we don't have enough mentors. We spend lots of time trying to figure out if we can even clearly articulate simple, immediately actionable tasks that someone can do successfully in a few hours or in a weekend where they can immediately see the payoff of that task and feel like, wow, I made a contribution that matters very, very quickly and it was great and I can see that and now I'm ready to do more, right? We spend a lot of time worrying about mentoring and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in truth, I would only give us an average-ish grade on it, right? Because it's hard. It's a lot harder than we think it is, in fact. It takes a lot of time to properly introduce somebody into a community as complicated as Fedora or some of the, the ones, whatever you guys work in. Um, so Chris Tyler, this professor at Seneca College, um, a few years ago started working with, uh, with Mozilla. Um, and what he was trying to do, and, this, and this, this idea that he had that I'm about to explain has sort of, has sort of been the, the germination of what has turned into teaching open source and that Red Hat has also been trying to add its weight and investment behind. What he was trying to do was work with the Mozilla organization to take his classroom of students and to successfully put them into the Mozilla community as part of their actual classwork, right, in a semester. How do you take someone in a semester who maybe does not have any previous experience working with open source, they've never used source control, they've never collaborated on a project with someone else because they've been taught from day one that if you work with the person sitting next to you, you're a dirty cheater who deserves to be expelled. Um, how do you take people who have never worked on software in the way that we work on it in the real world and put them into a meaningful project so that their end results aren't just some toy program that gets thrown away at the end of semester and never looked at again, but they can actually point to something real that they have contributed that is, you know, that is used and, 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 being, uh, uh, and had a purpose beyond just teaching you how to you know, do uh, linked lists, right? Um, the system that they used did a nice job of addressing this mentoring problem, right? And I would encourage you all to think about this in, in, in whatever your own projects are. There is nothing more uh, demotivational, I would say, than to take a newbie, an enthusiastic newbie, drop them into something, and then have them fail because you weren't able to properly support them, right? And Chris was afraid, not because of any flaws in Mozilla, because Fedora has all the same flaws and Canonical does and everyone probably has all the same flaws. Chris was afraid that if you took these newbies and you dropped them in 
directly into the project and ask them to sink or swim on their own that they just wouldn't be able to cope and they get flamed away and you know the whole thing would fail. So what they did was they set up sort of a sandboxed environment, right? And they got IRC and they had mailing lists and they did all the sorts of communication and collaboration that we do in open source, but they sandboxed the students away a little bit and the professors started out as kind of the integration point, right? The professors formed the relationships with the people in the community and were able to be that translation, right? And bring certain pieces of that community at the right time to the students while not flooding the community with a bunch of newbies and, you know, keeping everything more or less sort of working well together. This worked nicely and what it's led us to is a, is a, is a, is a project uh, that Red Hat sponsors that we call uh, Posse, right? We call it the Professor's Open Source Summer Experience, right? And it, and it came from this idea. Chris Tyler and his, and, his, and his teaching partner, a guy named Dave Humphrey, were successful because they understood the Mozilla community, right? They were able to find that subset of contributors within Mozilla who believed in their educational goals and they were able to work with, uh, work with that subset of contributors to create a good experience for the students. But there are a lot of professors who are understanding the power of open source, who are understanding that it is valuable to them to bring their students to open source, um, but this mentoring problem is where they get tripped up because the professors themselves don't necessarily have the experience working in an open source community, right? And how can you teach someone else to do something if you yourself don't have an idea generally of how to do it uh, uh, to begin with, right? Um, so what the Posse program is, and it's into its third or fourth year now, um, is basically a boot camp that Red Hat runs for professors who are interested in making open source a core part of the computer science classes that they're teaching. Professors who already have those classes, right? They know they're gonna be teaching in September, you know, a class about computer science and they're ready to make open source part of it. We run these professors through a week-long boot camp where we introduce them to bug tracking. We introduce them to source control. We teach them a bit about packaging. We make sure they understand how to collaborate on IRC and on mailing lists. We put them through a bit of an apprenticeship into open source so that they can form some relationships, they can gain some context, and they can, and they can begin to figure out how to bring that in turn uh, to their students. And here's one of the remarkable things. You talk about how Age doesn't matter in open source communities and how credentials don't even matter. Um, the posse workshops that we have done, in every case where we've had the day where we teach the professors about, you know, make files and getting code out of Git or Subversion or whatever, uh, the person who has taught that has been a college student themselves, right? Who has learned all of this stuff through their interactions with the Fedora project, and you have an active college student teaching university professors how to compile code the open source way, right? And it's, and it's tremendous, right? You should see, I, you know, I wish all of you could see it. Um, the professors love it, right? They love seeing how much enthusiasm there is, right? Because it inspires them to see, wow, there are, there are kids who are so far ahead and there are kids who have learned so much from the open source world, right? And, I, and, they, and they sit there and they think, I can bring that to my classroom, right? And, and we can grow this and we can make this happen. And the professors are the key to all of it because it's the only scalability point, right? The open source way um, uh, is so much about leverage, right? Um, uh, and, 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 and a professor properly, uh, properly resourced can bring the open source way of doing things to students every semester until the end of time, right? And those professors can then bring it to each other, right? One of the, tr one of the difficulties, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, in, you know, in, in, the, in the software industry, you know, more and more you say, hey, I work at Red Hat and, 
people are willing to open the door for you and let you in and they want to hear what you have to say, right? Red Hat's brand is very powerful in the software industry. In academia, we're still trying to gain credibility, right? I'm not saying Red Hat's brand is powerful to brag, it's just, you know, it, 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 we're a big company in, the, in, in, in Linux land. In academia, no one, you know, three years ago, no one knew who we are, no one cared in the slightest, right? And a lot of what we are trying to do with the teaching open source community, <coughs> pardon me, is bring those professors together, show them that Red Hat is trying to learn how to speak their language, right? And to try to gain some, some credibility over time in academia so that the open source way of doing things can continue to permeate computer science departments and can continue to sort of um, uh, revolutionize the way that computer science is taught. When I was in college, how many, how many people in this room did computer science in college? Either as a major or just a couple classes? A bunch of you, right? Um, uh, so I graduated from college about 10 years ago. Um, you guys can tell me your own experiences uh, if you want in a little bit. Uh, open source was not taught in my computer science classes. We were left to discover Linux on our own. We were left to discover CVS on our own. Uh, the professors all sort of assumed that we would, and everyone kind of did eventually, but it was seen as this curiosity you know, and this like additionally nerdy thing that you already nerds are, you know, you're already super nerdy to be doing computer science and now you're taking like an elective nerdiness to learn about Linux even outside that classroom. I'd like to see that change, right? I want to see that, you know, that, that, that's, what, that's what we are hoping to sort of flip on its head. Thank you. Um, and the teaching open source community is kind of part of that. I, I'm starting to ramble and whenever I start to ramble, I feel like I should stop and ask for any sort of comments or questions so far. Yes, please. So far, you've just done computer science professors. Yes. As you started looking at engineering and hard sciences for the, the people who end up having to write code so they're never trained to do it correctly. Yeah. Uh, because honestly, that's collaboration is going to help even further because they're all amateurs in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was uh, the question was, have we started to think about things outside of the scope just of computer science? Um, you're not going to love the answer here, Jeff, but I'll give it to you anyway. The answer is. We'd love to, of course, but um, resource limitations force us to focus on the thing that's closest to our core competency at Red Hat, which is computer science. Yeah, what, one thing we have seen is, for instance, you know, taking advantage of the fact that something like the Fedora project is so much more than just a bunch of code packaged onto a CD, but we do artwork, we do marketing, we do documentation. Um, we have, we've seen, we've seen um, for instance, one of the professors, a guy named Matt Jaded, who teaches at Allegheny College, uh, which is a liberal arts school in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've seen him take some students who were in a marketing class, like a digital, you know, marketing in the digital world or something like that kind of class. And he worked with us to change the homework assignments that those students did so that what they were doing was participating in the Fedora marketing team live during a release cycle of Fedora, right? And trying to produce some of the deliverables as their assignment that Fedora's marketing team would do. Um, was it the most successful thing that has ever happened and did it change the Fedora marketing project forever? No. Um, there was a lot of learning in both directions, right? Which is what you would expect the first time you try something. But the fact, that, the fact that the professor even wanted to give it a try and that the community members were willing to support that attempt to me shows that a connection at least has been made and that things can continue to grow. Now we would love to, we would love to expand to as many things as possible. I just don't, you know, it's just a question of scale and, and, and people, right? That's, that's, that's what I see. How many universities how many, have we? How many institutions have you pulled in computer science people from for your boot camp? Right. So, so we've, um, I think we're getting close to about 100 professors who have gone through the boot camp. Have any of them done the uh, local boot camp with other professors? Yeah. Um, the hope was, right, the hope, you know, 
the hope was when we started this, when we started this idea, and you, actually, Jeff, this brings me to, to the next point I wanted to make. The hope was that professors would come to this boot camp, they'd do it for a week, and then the next summer, you know, half of those professors who are now alumni of this boot camp would organize and run their own, right? Because all the content that went into it, of course, was openly licensed, and anybody could take it and sort of carry it on. Um, that, was an aggressive, that was an aggressive hope. Uh, part of the reason why that was aggressive was because uh, we, as in Red Hat, underestimated the difference between uh, sort of the life cycle of things in technology world and the life cycle of things in academia, right? Um, if I make a plan uh, for my team that goes a year ahead of time, um, there are certain people who will look at me like I'm crazy because, you know, how could you possibly know what is going to be happening a year from now? Don't even worry about it, right? In academia, we're learning if you make a plan that doesn't look three to five years into the future, you're a dilettante who has no conception of ability to sort of think and plan ahead, right? So the, the life cycles of these sorts of things, a six-month release cycle for Fedora, that's, I mean, that's crazy, right? Uh, you know, in academia, things are much slower. So to expect that, that a professor who does something one summer is ready to, uh, you know, uh, replicate and grow that one year later, that next summer of theirs might have already been planned and spoken for you know, two years ago, right? So uh, we've seen one good example um, where uh, uh, some professors at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and this is a, this is a, this school is a really interesting example because um, you know we like to think of universities as these sort of you know altruistic places of education, but they're in competition with each other as well, right? And they're trying to differentiate each other. And one of the things that the Rochester Institute of Technology is using as a differentiator is their embracing of open source, right? And they're trying to really aggressively make open source a part of their computer science department um, because they think that will attract brighter high school students who are already beginning to be introduced to that sort of stuff and want to go to school somewhere where they can do more and more of it. Um, a couple of professors that came to the, the posse that we did at, at RIT last year um, are organizing another one there this year and they've reached out to their sort of local, uh, you know, other, other professors and schools nearby. And that's been, that's been the, the example of, uh, of scale that we had sort of imagined. The thing that we have also done at Red Hat to try to modify our posse program um, is to change it from, from this, right? So here was the other problem that we noticed. We brought professors in for a week. I'll get to your question in a second. You can put your hand down. Um, we brought professors in for a week, and then we loosed them back upon their world, and we sort of hoped that they would use the teaching open source community as you know, a magnet, and they would all come back there and get on the mailing list and talk to each other. Um, uh, but it wasn't really the case, right? We found that we had a great week with them, and then a lot of them we sort of lost contact with. So one of the modifications that uh, Mel Chua, who leads Red Hat's education initiatives these days, um, has made is, and this, you guys will find this interesting, I hope. We've created some modules, right? We've broken Posse down using the theory discussed in the open source way, we've broken Posse down into a series of, uh, here, look at this sort of stuff, right? Release early, release often, upstreaming, version control, trackers and tickets, um, marketing, remixing, licensing. Uh, you know, we've tried to break down the things that we would teach professors all in one big long week into different modules and we're going to now, uh, what we're doing this summer is we're, we're trying this out with a 15 professor class. We're going to bring them all together for two days in July to make sure they meet each other, get some personal relationships. We'll go through the first module with them. And then we're going to, um, well, use the collaboration power of the internet to go through all of these other modules and the rest of this posse curriculum um, I, I think it's like every, every six weeks or something like that, we're going to bring them all together and do another one, but we're going to do, we're going to do that collaboration virtually, vo uh, video chat, IRC, things like that, um, and try to keep that heartbeat going with some consistency over the course of a year 
so that maybe we can kind of, you know, uh, keep their enthusiasm up, keep their attention up, and force them to collaborate more with each other, which will eventually turn into habit. So uh, that's, another thing, uh, that's another thing that we're doing. What's actionable out of all of this for you guys? Um, all, uh, most of you uh, probably, um, a lot of you raised your hand when you said that you did computer science sometime in your life, right? Maybe you had a professor or two who you feel like um, you'd like to get back in touch with and you know that they were uh, you know, already partial to open source or things like that and you'd like to introduce them to what's going on in teaching open source and, you know, and tell them to take a look at it and maybe come join this community. Um, this is, uh, this is a unique community because it's not about building a product in the end, right? The end game of this is something that enhances the value of open source for everybody, right? This is about mind share. This is about growing the mind share that open source has in the next generation of engineers, in the next generation of leaders, in the next generation of people who are going to be managing and running uh, uh, companies, right? And maybe, we'll, we'll, maybe we're focused on technology companies right now, but to your point, Jeff, we won't always be, right? Um, so yeah. What was your question in the back? Right. Right. Um, okay. You want to repeat what you said for uh, the video? Sure. I read recently about a project from FOSS at RIT that was to make a video chat program for deaf users to be able to talk in sign language. And I was wondering if you knew what the um, the name of the end re result was, or where we could find the code, or anything like that. Let's find out. I will Google it. Any other questions, comments, while we're figuring this out? Anyone who can get to Google on their own and find the answer to this question? Yes, sir. So um, it, it's always been my understanding that Unix, Linux started out in the EDU environment. It came out of the MITs. It came out of the um, uh, UC Berkeley's of the world. So what I'm understanding from you based on what you've said so far is that over the years since the origination of the first Linux kernels and all of that came out of, you know, because it all came out of, for example, I need to build a piece of software that will allow me to more accurately predict weather patterns. Okay, so let's build this piece of software and share it with other, other universities. So my question is, has there been a big disconnect in the engineering computer, computer science world over the past 15, 20 years where pretty much, you know, um, you got students that come out of um, uh, these programs and pretty much all they knew, know is .NET, and that's it? Is that what you're saying? Is there, or, yeah, because it's weird that... Yeah, uh, it seems like uh, there's people who have comments on that, so who wants to talk about that uh, before, before I do? Didn't start, I didn't mean to start a fire there. No, no, this is good. The less I talk, the better the talk goes. Yes, sir. Okay. First of all, three of us back here teach in a small university in West Virginia. Okay, 60% of our students coming in have to take remedial courses up front. So, we're already behind the eight ball when it comes to math and English. Further, as we go along through it, the students are not motivated. So how can we expect them to do projects that we assigned 15 and 20 years ago when all they want to do is sit around and tap on their cell phones and talk on Facebook and, you know, and play their video games? That's all they want to do. They don't even want to make a video game. Okay? So how can we expect them to do open source projects and, and bigger type things when I have a hell of a time getting a senior to write 200 lines of Java code in a week? And, and, and what's the answer? <laughs> you're, you looking, you're looking for it, you right? You tell yeah. me. 
Yeah. Hold on, one at a time. Who's next? Who wants to say something? There were like four people talking up here. Uh, I was just saying, you know, it's my impression that it's like that everywhere. I, I work at a, at a local university, and, and you know, I keep hearing that it's like that across the nation, across the world. So um, I don't have an answer. <laughs> okay. I, I have one comment to add to that. I, I'm, a, I'm a current student, and a lot of the schoolwork that I'm doing, um, it's not any of this open source stuff. It's, it's busy work in that I'm doing work that's been done by the last class, been done by the last class, and at the end of the class, there's no actual result that I can take and feel that I've contributed something, that I've, I've done anything. And it's also a lot different than the open source stuff that I do as a hobby. Um, I just see a big disconnect that um, I, I like this type of program in that I can feel that I'm doing something useful with my end of course mm -hmm. project. The thing that but you're definitely in the minority, I'll tell you that much. Because if you can't do the basic stuff, how are you going to get involved in an open source project? Is that a point? No, uh, it's a valid point. I mean, there's, you know, I think the, you know, I think what I'm hearing from you, sir, is that, you know, part of the issue is that uh, you've got, you know, you've got such a large continuum that students fall on as well, right? And, and I'm sitting up here 20 minutes ago talking about, you know, the kids that were the smartest kids in their high school class that already kind of knew everything that was trying to be taught to them, and they found open source because the magic of the internet and open licensing allows that open source to be there for them. And I think you're talking about... Now those kids are becoming business majors or social work majors. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. We're not getting the best and brightest in the technology. Okay. Yes, sir. I just graduated and uh, my school teaches Python. Um, and I don't know how much how big a deal it is versus Java. There's a spoiler plate you could argue, but the idea of having projects rather than going zero to 60, going from nothing to open source, like, you know, you're saying that's hard because you're not going to be able to contribute, you're not going to know what unit tests are, you know, before you know what a loop is. But having some sort of building up to it, you know, it, it, I think that is a strategy potentially. I'm sure you've had experience with that, but I would suggest something like projects as opposed to just dumbing people in open source, like, like small projects out of, you know, like build a poker program or whatever. So intermediate stuff before you jump into advanced stuff, and that's what works. That's what works at my school to some extent. I uh, I work in a community college, and I have some of the same problems as the gentleman in the back do. Um, but I also recently took a master's program in interactive technology that was horrifyingly easy. I mean, I could have done it in high school. It was really, really bad. And, and the, the people that I was in this master's program with were struggling. So we were talking yesterday about how degrees have become union cards. And if everyone deserves a union card, the, the issue is that education has to become more like an open source community where it's not about how old you are or what degree you have, but if you really have the chops to back up the degree that you say you have. Um, and that's, that's where education is, is not doing a service to the community in general. Who wants the mic next? No, I, I mean, I, 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 well, you make it, and, and then Smooch can have it. Just because I like you, Jeff. Yeah, that's unfortunate for you. So, one of the things that uh, we're good at in Fedora is we, uh, we let things fail, right? We let people try, they do, they do an adequately bad job of it, and then it's a failure, and they get told that. Uh, in academics, who, who, has, who has the stones to tell someone that they've really failed, that they've really messed up and they missed the point? <laughs> and, and not, no, I mean, but across the board. That guy. <laughs> I mean, across the board, how many people just get degrees because they've paid their money? They've paid their money, and they've done their time, and they're going to get out because the university can't have a 50% failure rate um, because it's a prestige thing. Whereas, whereas an open community, where the open source, you know, the prestige is in the numbers. It's in the, it's in the output. And... Uh, 
Well, it's, it's a problem. And um, in academics, there, there certainly there isn't necessarily the willingness to uh, be blunt uh, and to publicly shame, which we're good at in other contexts. <laughs> To answer the question earlier, video chat program to facilitate global deaf communication will premiere at June 21st through June, 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 yes, June, 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 um, to debut at an NTID sponsored symposium. Uh, it is called Opian. Where did I get this language? Open video chat is designed for one laptop per child computers. It should be ready, at, and if you look for it, there is a link. It is a add-on 4305 off of Sugar. Activities.sugarlab.org, add-on 4305. Thank you. I've been listening to your uh, about open source and change, but industry and technology is not really wanting change. Uh, I worked at a plastics plant for 30 years, and it was very hard to uh, come up with changes because basically equipment costs money. So. Um, I can see the point where people want to stay the same. You know, the, the guy doesn't want to have the human's uh, behavior, doesn't want to have to change the, the printer uh, queue every, you know, how, how, how a normal user is going to sign on to the printer every time. So, uh, and uh, we've seen this with um, when they did away with VMS as far as control systems. Uh, the, plan I was working at was a window that went to a windows based thing and every three years they changed windows mm -hmm. and uh, the IT boys and the process control people went through jumped through hoops trying to get things to work that three years ago worked and now three years don't right. so that's the it causes a lot of um, pushback to not bring in new stuff even if the new stuff is better, it will, I mean, will actually run better. But uh, mm -hmm. how, do, how do you address that in your? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, he's talking about he's talking about the, the resistance to change that exists. Uh, you know, even in the IT industry, for instance, and 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 what comes to my mind as as you say that is that it is not that. That, that doesn't have to be anti-open source, right? And I look, for instance, at, um, well, I'll use it because they uh, write my check every two weeks, but I, look at, I mean, I look at Red Hat's business model, right, where we've got, um, you know, the reason why Red Hat had to evolve over so many years was at the beginning, right, it was just Red Hat Linux, right? And everybody had the same Red Hat Linux, and Red Hat was a hat and t-shirt company that produced software as a side effect. Um, and the problem with Red Hat Linux, for all its goodness, was trying to serve two masters at the same time, right? The people who are the innovative you know, engineers who want to break things and who want to innovate by breaking, and then you know, the folks who are actually trying to deploy something with stability and consistency that doesn't change you know, for five to seven years. Um, and one piece of software, open source or closed source, couldn't make both those constituencies happy at the same time, right? So you can now have, you know, multiple vendors offering an enterprise Linux product for the folks that don't want change. And you've got, again, multiple vendors offering, you know, that innovative, um, fast paced, you know, we, we use Fedora, but, you know, substitute that for whatever you like um, for the makers, right? And, the, and, and, and there have been natural uh, there's natural synergies between those two things, right? Um, 
You know, we've got examples, uh, uh, examples from the history of Red Hat of engineers that work for some of our biggest company, our customers, uh, participating in the Fedora community and helping to build that next Red Hat Enterprise Linux that they will buy, right? One of the great powers of open source is that uh, our customers can help us build the product that we will sell them. <laughs> that's, that's a good deal if you're a product manager, right? Um, so that to me is how I address your point, which is open source doesn't have to equal uh, rapid change. Open source just allows us to take rapid change and stabilize it uh, in a more efficient way. I hope that maybe answered your question a little bit. You had a comment back there. You're going to probably fail me right now or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> He'll just make you come and take a retake at okay. 7 o'clock. One, one of the problems that we're talking about, how do you get students interested in this wonderful technology? Back in 1992, we, you know, 93, we set up a Linux system, 0 0.99, patch level 10, the great MCC distribution. Ran a server for the college. They didn't know it all. The president didn't know it for a year or two. But, um, so I set up this wonderful thing. I menu the libraries at first. They're getting library loans. I'm getting complaints. After about a month, I come in one Monday morning and there's no server space. I figure I've screwed up or something. So I start looking around, and what I discovered in the server logs is that the students had discovered funet.fi. You've been there? <laughs> you've been there, okay. <laughs> if you've been there, you'll understand. It was the, shall we say, first adult repository. After that, library usage versus that usage, there's this massive imbalance, okay? If you check the student server logs, what's coming out of the dorm traffic, there's another issue there, and it's the one that Von Braun and Mann, you're going to have to make this interesting. Now, some students will be interested. You still get traffic going over, you know, to the Git repository, but a lot of traffic goes various places, ESPN, Playboy, uh, some we're not going to mention. So... Part of what you're saying is how to get these students interested. The answer is 20 years ago it was the same problem. But some of them did become interested when they found out what they wanted to do. Some students, you gave them Fs, two years later they figure out why. Yeah. And it takes about that long for some of them. You know, beer's got to wear off and everything. So, <laughs> patience. Yeah. I mean, and that makes me think about sort of you know, I won't say it was the thesis statement of this talk, but one of the sort of core things that, that I care about, which is how do we use open source and how do we build communities of professors and their students who care about open source to give those students a more authentic and a more useful experience in getting their degree so that they walk out of that college and they can walk into any of the open source companies with a booth at this conference and already know how to be productive uh, engineers in that code base, right? And not have to learn that over the course of the first three years of their career, but they can, they can start it, right? I, these, these interns that work, you know, on my team who have been participating in Fedora since they were 15, um, I would hire them today, right? But this isn't the NFL where you tell a kid to drop out of college early for, you know, a billion dollar contract, right? Um, but I would hire them today if I could because they're already capable of doing everything that we would ask a junior level engineer to do. Um, so how do we make sure the rest of their college experience isn't just treading water, right? And making sure that they can continue to get even more and more out of what they're going to do as they get their degree and make sure that the process of getting a degree in computer science and the process of becoming a productive member of an open source community kind of gets into lockstep. I guess that's the best way I can summarize what I'm trying to talk about and what I care about. The teaching open source community is early. Like I said, academia's lifespan is long. Um, but this is where we're hanging out, trying to get things done, 
and everyone's invited, of course. So uh, I guess we're kind of close to out of time. I'm sort of done. If there's more comments or questions, we'll keep doing what we've been doing. But um, uh, I thank you all for your attention. If anyone wants a Fedora CD, come and take one. Anybody else want to say anything? Okay, thank you. What about this? I can help with like that. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did like this? You gave me a I good found idea. problem. How do you do that? that? It's like this. Well, I disagree. Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.